Hello, welcome back to the channel. And today we will be talking about compensation for software engineers in Seattle 2019. All right, let's get into it. If this is your first time on the channel, my name is Zia. I talk about software engineering, programming, and interviews in general on this channel, so subscribe. Before we start talking about how much software engineers in Seattle are making today, let's talk about what makes up total compensation. At a high level, there are three components here. Number one, there is your base salary, which is how much you're getting paid day to day. Second component here is RSUs, or restricted stock units. That is your stocks or stock options, uh, which are a way of tying your performance with the performance of the company. And the third thing here is signing bonus. A lot of people actually forget this component, but signing bonus is a critical, critical component of what makes up compensation for software engineers. So let's talk about each one of them individually and how can you make the best of your salary compensation negotiation. First thing, salary. So salary is how much you're getting paid and that is the fixed amount. Typically for software engineers, it could range from $60,000 per year to about 150, 160, or maybe even $200,000 per year, depending on your experience level. Now, for some companies, the salary is actually fixed across different titles. So for example, if you're software engineer one and software engineer two, your salary might be fixed at maybe like $100,000 or $150,000 per year. That's pretty typical, right? So for a lot of software engineers, fixed salary is actually the least amount that they make based on those three components, okay? And I'll explain the reason why in a little bit, but just kind of keep that in mind. Second component here is restricted stock units, RSUs, okay? So RSUs are where the big money's at. Typically, for software engineers, when you join a publicly listed company like Twitter or Google or Facebook, they offer you a number of restricted stock units in order to compensate you for the performance of the company. And there's the idea of vesting period as well, which is the idea here is that the stock units are typically vested or spread throughout a, diff a period of time. So for example, a typical vesting period is 25% over four years. So your stock options or your stocks are typically vested over four years where you get a quarter of that in the first year, you get another quarter of that in the second year, third year, and fourth year. To be much more concrete, let's assume that you work for company A and they offer you a thousand stock units over four years and the vesting period is 25% each year for four years. What that means is that in the first year, you will get 250 RSUs, in the second year, you get another 250, and so, forth, so on and so forth. So by the end of your four years, you would have gotten a total of 1,000 RSUs. The reason why I said that RSUs is where the majority of the money comes from is that imagine that you work for a startup that goes public or goes IPO. IPO stands for Initial Public Offering. Typically, when a company goes public, maybe it goes public for $10 per share. If you join the company early enough, maybe before it goes public, where they offered you a thousand stock units at $5 per share, that means your stock compensation has just doubled overnight when it goes public. Instead of $5, it is now $10 per share. And if your, your 1,000 RSUs has turned into $10,000 from $5,000. Now, if the company keeps doing well, where it goes from $10 to $40, your $10,000 has now become $40,000, okay? So that's a 8X increase from $5,000. The, the third and final component here is your signing bonus. So signing bonus is typically an amount that the company pays you when you sign up to join the company. Now that signing bonus could be paid out in the first year or maybe in like the first few months, but there's usually a policy in there where you have to stay with the company for X number of months or maybe years in order to keep that signing bonus. Now, some companies spread that signing bonus over X number of years as well. So I know Amazon, for example, previously had this policy where that would give you two signing bonuses, one in the first year and another one in the second year as a form of compensation. So 
now that we've talked about the three components that make up compensation, let's talk about how much negotiation room is there? How much wiggle room is there for each of those components? First, salary. Now, typically salary for different companies doesn't change that much between levels. For example, if you're SDE2, or maybe like a, maybe you had like two or three years of experience as a software engineer and you're making $150,000 per year in terms of salary. Now, when you go to a different company, they might keep you sort of within that range, maybe an additional $10,000 to sweeten the deal, to sweeten the pie, so to speak. But usually, there's not as much wiggle room for you to negotiate. The second part here is signing bonus. Now, signing bonus, in my opinion, has much more wiggle room where you can kind of negotiate a little bit more or less depending on how you approach the problem or how you approach the negotiation process. process. The third and final component here is RSUs. I think, in my personal opinion, RSUs are probably the area where you can negotiate a little bit more, right? Because companies typically when they hire you, they're trying to find people who are invested in the company and believe in the company in the long term. So, so when you negotiate for more RSUs, that typically shows that you as a candidate is much more vested in the company and you believe in the company long term and they're much more willing to kind of wiggle with you in terms of more uh, RSUs. Huh, of course. Now, a little side tip here. Don't let monetary value as a whole control your decision of whether you want to join a company or not. Because for several reasons. One, well, I will make a separate video about this, but I just want to give you a high level idea here, which is one, the benefits matter as well. For a software engineer, you might be able to negotiate for much more off time or vacation time. You can also talk to your manager about responsibilities. Are you coming in as a tech lead? Or are you coming in as a, a senior person who will lead the team and help guide the team, build the, the team's culture? Secondly, you can also negotiate other things like 401k, for example, your retirement plans. Some companies have really, really good retirement plans where they match up to 5% or 6% of your salary and some companies have really great insurance plan as well. If you have a big family and you have kids and you want to save on your insurance, especially in the US, then some companies that offer insurance plans for the whole family might make a lot more sense to you. Again, those are some of the things that might influence your decision. At the end of the day, I don't think that monetary value is the only thing that determines whether you should work for a company or not. Other things like where the company is going. Do you believe in the mission of the company? Do you believe in the team? Do you have the opportunities to learn new things and build new skills? Those are, in my opinion, much more important things as a software engineer that should play into your decision making. Hopefully, I hope that this video has helped you learn a thing or two about compensation for software engineers. With that said, I'll see you next time. Bye.